This podcast is sponsored by the Tollington Arms on Hornsey Road, a bubbly pub with a Thai kitchen, home to thousands of Arsenal fans every season. Open daily from noon. Hello and welcome back to the Guna Ramble. It's uh, me and Akil once again. He is a little under the weather because he's trying dry January, and I think his body is working against him. But how else are you? Are you doing okay otherwise, Akil? Yeah, I think that's true. Actually, you know, the less <coughs> excuse me, the less I drink, <laughs> and it seems like it's having a, a negative impact on me. But um, anyway, I, I'm still I'm still here. I'm still surviving, uh, ready to talk some Arsenal. Very good, very good. And we have two special guests this week. We have Ryan Rocastle, who's been on the podcast before. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Happy New Year. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And the newcomer is Anne-Marie. Uh, I forgot your last name already. I apologize. <laughs> go, ahead and introduce, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Anne-Marie Batson. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy All right. New Year. And Anne-Marie, you work in sports broadcasting. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay. So we beat Fulham on New Year's Day. We beat Blackpool here in the FA Cup. You know, victories, but in my opinion anyway, they weren't terribly, you know, they didn't inspire a lot of excitement. Uh, how did you see it, Akil? Um, I mean, I thought, thought thought we were quite professional in both. Um I got. I mean, the Fulham game seems ages ago, to be honest. Um, yeah. But it was one of those games where we we, we knew we just had to win um, after kind of the defeat at Anfield and, and the draw at Brighton. Our home record generally has been quite good. So um, yeah, it was one of those where you know there was there was times where Fulham were were quite good at times. You know, you, you kind of you think if they fight like that, then they'll probably stay up or, or they should stay up. But generally, I thought we were quite professional. Um, I mean, I, I guess the game will be remembered for uh, the Lacazette substitution. Because obviously when he went off, Aaron Ramsey came on. There was a little bit of a vocal kind of vocal negative reaction, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Um, and that wasn't for Aaron Ramsey coming on. That was more for Alex Lacazette going off. Um, but then obviously Unai Emery got it right because Aaron Ramsey went, went on and scored, um, played well, and we won the game. So, um, yeah, it, it's, I know we're going to talk a lot about Unai Emery and the project, but I mean, that was, that was probably the first time where we saw a little bit of a, it, it, it kind of felt like we were back in the Arsene Wenger days, you know, yeah, and like yeah. you, you think of that kind of famous Man United game when, was it Andre Arsharin came on for Alex Oxford Chamberlain? Think about that, um, Francis Coquelin coming on for Olivier Giroud at Villa Park. It just felt like one of those moments, but obviously this was under Unai Emery. Um, so yeah, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, but yeah. I'm sure we'll we'll see. Uh, and then obviously we went to Blackpool. Um, again, it was a slightly strange game. Um, I didn't actually make the trip, um, just kind of being a bit under the weather. But you know, I've got I've got a mate who's a Blackpool fan who used to go kind of home and away to watch Blackpool, but hasn't been for about three or four years in protest over the owners. And we obviously saw that there with with half the ground kind of empty. In fact, yeah. there was more Arsenal fans than there were Blackpool fans. So it, it, it's a sad state of affairs. I think you know, as, as football fans. You you kind of, I think you have to kind of respect the uh, the protest, respect the fans that are trying to do something about it, and generally you just wish them good luck. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it was a strange game, like you said. I, I think uh, with the experience we had at the back, we gave up a, a few shocking chances, but we kept the clean sheet. Just uh, Anne Marie, uh, particularly you know, looking at all things football, what do you make of uh, not only the Blackpool game, but also the situation they have with their ownership? The ownership at, at Blackball is a, a long-running saga between the fans, as Akil alluded to, and the current owners. And there's a lot of legal stuff going on around it, so I'm quite cautious about what I can, what I can and can't talk about. But the one thing that is clear is that there is a big dissatisfaction between the fans and the supporters, and you could see that when I was watching the match. It just lacked a bit of an atmosphere, and you know, good on the Arsenal fans for travelling all that way because you know, getting from North London up to Blackpool is no mean feat, which I'm sure Akil can tell us all about at a later date. Um, but it was strange because you wanted to see you wanted to see a good match and, you know, all props to the Blackpool fans because they're making their voices heard. I think I I just want to pick up the point about the, the games that Arsenal have played so far this season. The thing that I keep reading and I keep hearing is the words papering over the cracks. 
And you mentioned about, uh, Rick, you talked about, you know, conceding. And I think that's quite the key thing. It was good mm-hmm. to see, you know, with the Blackpool game that we were more aggressive going forward. My worry, as with Fulham, they were able to get a goal back against us. And I think we've only, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've only had two clean sheets so yeah, far. Sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, a big red flag for me. I don't know what you gents think, but that's quite worrying. And I do wonder how Unai Emery is going to solve that problem. Like I said, it was fantastic to see the youngsters come on for Blackpool. For them, it's a great opportunity. It's a great experience. It showed that we have, you know, people within the team that are fast, that are strong, technically gifted, but defensively, I think those words papering over the cracks are starting to concern a lot of the fans. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those. I am concerned as well. Um, Ryan, you haven't been uh, with us for a little while, um, so maybe not necessarily the Blackpool game specifically, but what do you make of the last few games Ar- Arsenal have played? I mean, it's it's been, I think it's been difficult because, uh, I think it's been difficult because we went on uh, such a good run. Uh, how many games was it? 21 or 22? I can't remember. 22. 22 or so, yeah. yeah. And I don't think, uh, I don't think anyone expected that. Um, and I think us going on that run, I know it wasn't the most, always the most convincing in terms of how we got the results, but the fact we were getting them and, you know, up until, up until like a month ago, I think we were you know, six or seven points off, off first place. Um, and I think that run kind of, kind of made, enhanced people's expectation. And, and this month has been, I think, I think what's happened is this month is actually we've got in, in some of the games what, what we deserved. Whereas in, in the ones before we had, we had managed to to come back and, and, and win the game, or, you know. Um, and I just think that this month is caught up with us a bit, and um, you know we've had some we've had some bad results, we've had some bad performances. Um, but in terms of uh, the overall course of the season, I, I think Unai Emery is do, doing a, a pretty good job, to be honest with you. Uh, it's obviously it's not his team. Um, you know, it, it's he's he's had six months to work with the players, so he's he has to be given that time to see which ones are going to fit into how his how he works, which ones you know he can adapt to, which ones he can't. And for me, I always said at the start of the season, this is uh, going to be a transitional season, but um, we are now we're in a pretty good position, to be honest with you. We're and we're in a position now where. At the start of January, if you had offered me, you know, that we're in, t- in touch of the, the top four, I think three points off it, I, I'd, I'd be pretty satisfied. So I, I'm, I think he's doing a good job, but it, it's been a tough month. Well, last month was a tough month. I, I, I actually remember talking on the podcast, and it's kind of weird how it, it's always a bit of a seesaw and a bit of a roller coaster with Arsenal. Because I remember at the start of the season, a little bit like you, Ryan, saying that <laughs> it's going to be a year of transition. I don't expect anything. If we're sixth or seventh, so be it. Unai Emery needs time. And then probably about six, seven weeks ago, I was saying, well, actually, expectations have slightly changed. And that's because Unai Emery's done so well. Actually, I now think we could get fourth place. Uh, we, we, we look, and this was when you were saying that we were seven, eight points off the top and we looked good. Um, I thought, you know, that was when Jose Mourinho was still here. So Man United suddenly, you know, weren't a concern. Uh, Spurs even were dropping points. They've obviously gone on a, a, a quite a good run. I hate to say it. Apart from the Wolves game, I think they've gone on quite a good run. Um, so and, and obviously even Chelsea were kind of dropping points and maybe still are. But it, it, it suddenly the last kind of month or so has kind of brought us down to earth. Since that Southampton game when we lost to Southampton, what about a month ago? We've obviously been to Brighton. We've drawn. We've lost to Liverpool and we lost quite badly to Liverpool. Um, we've we've got at the League Cup as well, which which obviously was was slightly uh, you know disappointing. Um, so suddenly expectations have kind of gone back to the start of the season now, where we feel actually maybe it is that transitional year, and we'll kind of see how we go. Um, 
But it's it's I think we'll we'll go through this quite a lot this season. We'll, we'll go through periods where when we win three or four, we'll think, oh, we're back in this. We could finish fourth. Then you might drop points, and you might think, oh, actually, maybe it is that transitional year. I don't, I don't know how you feel, Anne Marie, on that. Well, I was going to say, do you think Unai Emery has that luxury of having a transitional year, given the pressure that Arsenal are not part of the Champions League? If it's another year out of Champions League football for let's say 2019-2020, how does that impact the club financially? I do wonder when people say and talk about, oh, it's a transitional year, let's not take that for granted because there are pressures for him to meet certain targets. Let's say he has to reach top four or he has to make the Champions League next year because I, I do wonder about Stan Kroenke's position in all this and what he thinks about providing investment to build the team that Unai Emery wants. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting over here in the United States, actually in St. Louis, uh, so our opinions here of Stan Kroenke are not good. So uh, I don't anticipate a lot of spend out of the Kroenke's uh, to to bring Arsenal back into it. But uh, Well, we, we, we saw there was a, I think it was a BBC uh, piece the other day about kind of how much owners have actually spent and, and, and put into the club. And obviously Arsenal has been absolutely zero yeah. um, with Stan Kroenke and, and, and KSC. And, and that's not going to change. You know, um, uh, the new sort of managing director, Vinay, has kind of said that we're going to support the self-sustainable model, which basically means you spend what you earn. Um, you don't spend your owner's kind of money. Um, and it looks like we're going to, we're going to stick to that. So what that means for, for January, um, I, I, not sure, um, but certainly going forward, it, it's going to be. I mean, the, the, the Champions League is massively important. You know, it's it's kind of forty, forty-five million a year mm-hmm. that the Champions League brings you. So, it's massively important. But then, you know, Arsenal aren't like Chelsea or, or City or even Man United. You know, I just think that I think Unai Emery will be given a year, whatever happens, wherever he finishes. If he doesn't win a cup, if he finishes sixth or seventh, I still think he'll be given a year because I think, or, or if not more, because I just don't think it's the Arsenal way. And yeah, you could argue that Arsenal has changed so much in a year. You know, we, we've had personnel move on and it's, it's probably not the same club as it was about a year ago. But still, I, I just think, you know, a, a lot of people talk about the values of Arsenal. Raul and Vinay have both, you know, the two guys who have kind of replaced Ivan have both talked about the values of the club. So the values of the club is to support your manager, to back your manager and to give your manager time. So I'm, I'm hopeful we'll see that. Yeah, and it's it's been a very recent change as well. I mean, we knew Arsene Wenger was leaving at the end of the season, but we didn't lose uh, Ivan Gazidis until summer was almost over, and we've had to kind of pick up the pieces and start the season. Um, as far as the changes Arsenal have made, Ryan, um, what are you, your views on this? Do you think it's uh, something that's going to take three years, or can we expect some results a little sooner? Yeah, no, I think... I think that for me personally, I know I understand what you're, you're saying about uh, how long can, can you be in transitional. Um, but I did think if you have to look, compare it to other clubs who have got rid of their managers in the, you know, say the top six, um, you look at in Man City's first season, Guardiola with more resources finished I think he got Champions League on the last day. Um Klopp in his when he took over, I think they finished six or seven. I think Mourinho in the league finished sixth with Man United. Um and they uh got the Champions League through the Europa League, which of course is a path for us. Um so I, 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 there was Chelsea with uh, Conte they they won the league actually but theirs was a little bit different because um, they didn't have Europa League, you know, so I think he was working, they were just working on the Premier League and he managed to already have, I think that Chelsea squad as well, I think was in a better better condition than the Arsenal one. So for me, um, yeah, this is, I would be very, in fact, I, there's no way, in my opinion, that Unai Emery is even if we were to finish sixth and, and win nothing, is not going to be in charge of Arsenal at the end of the season. I just, I can't see it. I don't think it makes any sense at all because, as I said, he this year he's still trying to figure out what what players he wants, 
what can fit into his system, uh, the way he wants to play. And I think he have to, he has to be given um, a, a season to figure that out, and then hopefully next summer put that put his plans into action, and then go again. Uh, and just a quick thing as well on mm-hmm. on transfers. Liverpool, when they Liverpool in the last few years, in my opinion, have been the team who've got the the best transfers right. Yeah, I've just looked at I've just been looking at some of the their signings that they've made. Right, and it's only this year in 2018 where they've signed um, Van Dijk and, and Allison, where they've where they've signed genuine, proven, world class players. Right before that, people like. Um, Mane, uh, Firmino, um, even Mo Salah, you know, they, Robertson, they, they were, they were good players, but they weren't world class players and they didn't cost a load of money. So you can get by if you have a good transfer strategy and you get players that you want and the manager can really work with. You don't have to spend loads of money to, to get it right. True, and true. What, and, uh, yes. go ahead, go ahead. I was saying to pick up on your point then, that nicely leads into, segues into the changes that Arsenal have made at top level, at high level, bringing in, as you've mentioned, you know, Vinay and Raul, who are replacing Ivan Gazidis. It is a long-term project, isn't it? And let's not forget about Sven either, coming over from Borussia Dortmund. It's like a new broom has been sweeping clean. And I think looking the way, as you've mentioned already, about Ryan, talking about Liverpool, I read somewhere it's taken them at least six transfer windows to get to the window where they are, to get to the place where they are today. One would say that Arsenal would need that, maybe not that length of time, but just need to be given some transfer windows, as you say, to bring, so Unai Emery can bring in the team and the players, obviously, that he wants. And having these new gentlemen who are sitting, the higher-ups that are now part of the board, Ivan Gazidis is gone. Wenger is gone. You know, it's a new chapter. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. Um, I think some Arsenal fans are impatient, but I think that's because they were just so exasperated by the time of the end of Wenger's tenure. They were desperate for change. And I think a lot of eyes are going to be on these four gentlemen sitting at the top table to ensure that they follow through with Arsenal values, that they bring in world class players that bring and that bring something different and can lift the team and then you know Emery can start to shape Arsenal in the way that he feels can deliver those trophies and those accolades and those titles that have been long overdue for the Gunners. Yeah and uh Akil we'll, we'll go back to you looking at the future here uh Unai Emery is a designated as a coach not a manager so we don't know how much say he has in signings and I'm just playing devil's advocate here. So, you know, looking forward, not just January, but the summer, uh, I'm wondering how much of, how much of a stamp Emery can put on this team by himself. He's obviously got to work with others. We're also, we don't have a, like a Coutinho asset to sell like Liverpool did to, to bring in those other resources like Van Dyke. What do you, what's, what's realistic, uh, looking forward and uh, Emery working with others to achieve what he wants? Yeah, that's, that's a good point on the Coutinho thing, to be fair. Um, but I mean, yeah, Unai Emery's a head coach. <clears throat> the structure's obviously changed massively. So, uh, what, two years ago, you had, you had an owner, you had a CEO, you had, um, the, the, the manager of the club. <clears throat> and then you had like the, you know, the head scout who reported into the manager, Steve Rowley. You had, you know, people like that into kind of Arsene Wenger. Obviously, that's all changed. Unai Emery. <clears throat> I mean, technically has probably slightly less power. Um, but I think it's all about, you know, it, it, Unai Emery will know what sort of players he wants. You know, he'll, he'll, you know, whether they're kind of players that can go on the high press, players who have more technical ability, or whatever it is, he'll sort of know that. Um, and then it, it's up for the, it, it's up to the rest to kind of support that. Um, we saw that sort of last January, actually, with, uh, Mavna Panos that came in. He was one that I don't think Arsene Wenger had much to do with. I think it was a Sven signing. And if you actually remember, Arsene Wenger said he's going to go out on loan. Then he sort of a month later said, actually, he's going to stay with us. And then we saw him play at the end of the season. So mm-hmm. that to me meant that Arsene Wenger didn't really know him, gave him a chance in training and thought, actually, <clears throat> this lad's all right. Um, so I kind of see that going on as well. I, I see Sven 
you know, doing his job, coming up with players, maybe then having that kind of conversation with Raul and with, with, with Unai Emery about the players he's found. And then I think what, what excites me about this is obviously when, when Arsene Wenger first came in 1996, we, he knew certain markets. He knew the French market, for example. He had worked with players, you know, he had worked with Thierry Henry in Monaco. He knew that if he could bring Thierry Henry here, pretty much under the radar because, you know, he, he wasn't doing that well at Juventus. If he could bring him here, he knew, he knows he can turn him into an absolute star. And, and that's exactly what he did. And that's what excites me about now, that Unai Emery will have players in mind that he's worked with, you know. And hopefully <clears throat> the same thing will happen. We, we, you know, we're, we're heavily linked with someone like Dennis Suarez at the moment. And Dennis Suarez is a player that Unai Emery's worked with, knows, um, Dennis Suarez himself a couple of years ago talked about how Unai Emery is one of the best coaches he's ever kind of worked with as well. So that actually excites me. There's a player that he knows, Unai Emery knows, that he wants to bring in to play his style, to play the Arsenal style as well, who he can improve. So I'm hoping this whole thing will replicate what Arsene Wenger did in 96, um, you know, because I think that's kind of where we're going to be. I mean, as, as kind of Ryan points out, the Mo Salahs, the Mane's, they weren't, you know, Mo, Mo Salah, when he was, 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 you know, when people talked about Mo Salah before he... He was a forgotten player. He was a forgotten player. He, <laughs> yeah. he, he was there at Chelsea, but didn't really do much. I think he went to Roma, didn't he? Played well there, but obviously, if if, if, it's, if you're not playing in England, generally people in England don't really think about you. So, it, it's, you know, it's all about, I mean, Jürgen Klopp obviously knew that he could get the best out of Mo Salah and, and kind of did the deal. So... Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of excited, you know, even if there are players that are slightly under the radar a little bit that we don't know much about. Um, I, you know, I've, I've kind of got confidence in Unai and Sven and Raul to, to firstly get the deal done, but then for Unai to work with them and actually really improve them. Very good, very good. Um, considering the, uh, I guess we'll call the Emery project, uh, uh, Emery, um, looking at his... I guess the amount of influence he can enforce at Arsenal. How do you see this playing out? Well, it's a really, really good question. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball so I could tell you. I think it's the changes that he's made. You know, first of all, playing from out the back. I think that is still that is becoming more popular as we've seen it in the Premier League. Um, and I think, well, I believe that Emery is trying to transform Arsenal into a better passing unit <laughs> and um, i think i think uh, in the blackpool game check took that a little too far <laughs> playing out of the back <laughs> and that, that he, and exactly right and i think <laughs> it's still a work in progress to be honest as you said you know check slightly struggling with it and maybe leno as well not quite there yet but those days of lumping the ball forward you know over the heads of everybody hoping that somebody in the midfield or the forward is going to pick up i think is is changing now. So I think there's a real clear strategic shift in how to use the goalkeeper more, seeking out to play out from their own third. The other thing that I would say is I, I love the pairing of Aubameyang and Lacazette. And I know in the last couple of matches or so, you know, we've seen Lacazette, sorry, we've seen Aubameyang up on his own. But I enjoy watching the pair of them together. I think they have fantastic chemistry they read each other really well um and it's such a joy to watch them together as well and i know emery's been tinkering with the system but i'm hoping that he will persist with that because those two i think could be a force that defenders will become worried about in the premier league such is the way that they can read each other's game the way they service each other as well the fact that they can get goals which is what we all want it's a relationship that's blossoming as we've seen off the pitch as well, and, and I'm hoping that Emery will invest in that more. Um, and the other thing as well, I would say, is about his coaching style. I think, would it be fair to say, Akil, that Wenger was a bit hands-off when it came to the coaching, whereas now Emery uh, very much more hands-on? Yeah, I mean, he, he was he was hands-on in terms of in training. He, he took every session. He was a little bit of a control freak there. But in terms of, yeah, I mean, you know, we've heard from a lot of ex-players who, who say that, Arsene, you know, when mistakes happened, Arsene Wenger would sort of let you work it out yourself because he would say you're intelligent enough to know you've done wrong and to kind of work it out yourself. Whereas 
it's completely different with Unai Emery. Um, you, you, you've actually reminded me of something, but when we have a set piece, uh, when we, I think when we were defending the set piece, Unai Emery, who usually is always at, on the touchline, he actually goes and sits down when we're defending the set piece. And his assistant manager, or one of his assistants, obviously Boldy's one, but the other one, he actually goes up and he starts to organise it. And it's only when the ball's cleared, they swap over again. And then Unai Emery gets to the front again and the other guy sits back. And then the other guy doesn't just sit down. He then explains to the subs and the players that are there what he did and why he did that, which is just a, it, it's fascinating. Cause I, I sat kind of behind the dugout for the league cup games. Cause obviously you can move about a bit there and it was just absolutely fascinating. Um, but yeah, next time you're watching Arsenal, look out for that because you will notice that and it is, it is fascinating. Sorry yeah, to interrupt though. It's no, 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 a really good answer. The other thing I, I was going to say, just actually agreeing with your point is I've noticed Emery when he's, Whoever is on the back line, he will hold his arm out and, and tell them not to move any more forward to stay in line with his arm. I don't know if you've noticed that. I was watching the game with my dad and I kept saying, look at Emery. He keeps sitting, he's standing at the touchline. He's sticking his arm out and he's telling his, his back three or back four not to move any further than his arm. And I find that quite interesting because I notice a lot of teams now, a lot of the defenders go quite far forward, but we seem to be keeping one or two players back. And given defensive um, capability at the moment, I think he's looking to for people to understand their positions more and understand their roles more. And I think that's where he's improving one or two players within the team. We know, you know, Iwobi has been a revelation for me. I, I know for some people they're not exactly feeling him right now, but I think he's blossomed over the last few weeks. And I believe that's under, Iwobi, um, under Emery's um, coaching. Yeah, I think uh, Awobi, speaking of Awobi, I think he came back from the, the World Cup with a little more confidence than he's had in the past as well. And I, while I think he can, he certainly has a, a more to go if he's going to really be a, an Arsenal starter week after week, but he is creating some dangerous situations. Um, he just needs to finish them. Uh, but moving on to another player, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to Ryan here. Um, Aaron Ramsey looks like he is on his way out the door at the end of the season. It doesn't look necessarily like he's leaving in January. But uh, what do you make of the Ramsey situation? Uh, it's a difficult one because I think ideally, you know, you, obviously you don't have a player of his quality leaving on a free transfer, you know, and I think going forward that is something that that can't happen in, in the future, you know. We, we, we can't get that that wrong um yeah i think i think if from what we're being told is unai has a, had a look at him and then decided actually no it's, it's not it's not for a player he wants to move forward with he'd rather move him on and you know maybe spend the wages on on someone else and i don't have any problem with that at all like if he's if he's identified, if that's what he's seen, he's worked with the players, he's got his own di- ideas. Um, but I just think in an ideal world, let, if Unai had taken charge, let's say in January, last January, and he had looked at him for six months and then in the summer, he decided that was it, that he wasn't for him and we sold him on. I, I don't mind, I don't mind be- a manager being decisive like that. Um, I, I think, it's a tough one because he's Ramsey's obviously given us fans some really great moments, and and we have we have an attachment to him. Um, but I I don't mind that decision being made. Um, but going forward, we can't afford to lose players of that quality um, for for free transfers. Certainly, and uh, Akil, I think um, you had mentioned that the uh, some of the fans at the Blackpool game were reacting on Ramsey as well. Well, it was, there was a, there was a chant saying Aaron Ramsey, we want you to stay. So it was one of those uh, you know moments that I, I looked at and thought, as 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 supporters, we obviously have <coughs> affection towards certain players, um, <coughs> to, towards even the manager, coaching, or so whatever. But I mean, Aaron Ramsey's one; he's called two cup final goals. We obviously saw the incident at Stoke in 2010, it was, when he broke his leg. So <clears throat> we feel quite close to Aaron Ramsey because of his kind of history with our club. He's been at our club for, what, eight, eight to ten years? Um, 
and you know that's 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 a hell of a long time. So it, mm-hmm. it, you kind of you kind of understand the fans <clears throat> that were there that were singing the song and, and you know wanting him to stay and stuff like that. But at the same time, as Ryan says, I think if you're going to trust the project and trust the manager, then you kind of have to let him, you know, and, and let the club do what they're going to do. Um, and that also tells me that they are in it for the long haul as well. Because I think if you were, if you weren't sure on a manager or you were thinking that, OK, if he doesn't hit these requirements in the first year or second year, he'll be out then I'm not sure you you would let someone like Aaron Ramsey leave because you, you don't know who the manager's going to be. So I think it's very much a, a project that they're set on. Um, and they kind of, you know, they, they they really kind of value themselves, if, if you know what I mean. They're, they have confidence in themselves to deliver it. So, yeah, the Ramsey thing is kind of upsetting as a supporter because I would love him to stay. But, I mean, Unai Emery and the club think that they could spend that 200 grand a week elsewhere. Um and, and, you know, if that's the case, then you, you kind of just have to back it, really. Um, so, uh, you know, as Ryan rightly points out, it, it's a shame that we didn't get to this place in the summer. And then we could have sold him for 40, 50 million and, and kind of, you know, uh, invested that back into the squad. But, I mean, it's one of those things where you just have to support. You just have to back the, the, the club. But I totally get why fans are a bit nervous. And, and, and to be honest, you know, I look at our squad. And I think, I mean, with Ramsey kind of, you know, I know he's probably going to go in the summer, but I mean, I tell you what, if a 30 or 40 million pound bid comes in, I'm not, I'm not sure it will, but if it did, even a 25 million pound bid, the club will be in such a big dilemma on what to do. And considering our midfield, you know, we've, we've obviously let Jack Wilshire go, we've let Santi Cazola go, who both were sort of injury prone players, but Santi's actually played really well. I think he scored two against Madrid the other night. Um, Jack's obviously injured, but he, Jack played more than he's played in, in several years last season with us. So we're suddenly at a stage where if Aaron Ramsey was to go in January, you know, uh, I think El Nelly, I'm not sure he's fancy too much. I think Wendozi's a cracking young player, but I think he still needs time. So suddenly you're you're kind of one injury away from a bit of a crisis. That's in central midfield with Serrera and Shaka, the only two. If one of them were out, you know, you would be sort of, you'd be in a bit of trouble. So, uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I support the project and I, I back the manager or the head coach, you know, all the way. But, you know, as a supporter, I, I, you know, you can't just back them blind. You can't just, uh, you know, think a hundred percent, they'll do everything right. You know, everyone's human. And, and I, I look at sort of another example. I look at Callum Chambers at loan, uh, on loan at Fulham. And I think, oh, we could have bloody done with him here. You know, nobody <laughs> knew that Rob Holding was going to get injured, but. Did if if I mean we started with the back four at the start of the season and maybe you know we thought a back four was was what he's going to do until he actually got sort of into the English game more and realised actually sometimes you will need a back five for protection. But if we knew we were going to play a back five and we let Callum Chambers go and we we knew Lauren Koscielny's kind of out for a few months, we probably knew Mavropanos is out for for a little while as well. That letting Chambers go on loan was was. Just, you know, it, it, it was it was a questionable decision. I think as fans, we're allowed to ask the questions and we're allowed to ask that, is it worth us not giving Ramsey a new contract? Is it worth Chambers going out on loan? But I mean, ultimately, it's it, 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 it's the project that deals with these kind of things. And, and I think pretty much you have to back them. Yeah. And uh, go ahead. Say, yeah. Just to say on Akil's point, Akil, do you not think, though, that maybe the seeds for this were sown a long, long time ago? The whole situation around Sanchez, the whole situation about um, Ozil's contract as well, his wages, Mkhitaryan's wages, kind of put Arsenal on the back foot. But maybe it's a fault of their own for not sit- looking at the bigger picture. So yeah, I mean, I mean that's... I- decisions very quickly that put them in a slightly awkward position leading to the point as you just accurately described about you know if somebody was to in the midfield if we lost some, another strong character in the midfield and Ramsey's gone and Callum Chambers is elsewhere we're in a, we're in real trouble so do you think that this was something that was was this something that could have been foreseen is my question I, I, you know, it's 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 a tough question to be honest to answer without knowing what's going on. But last January was absolutely huge for this football club, in my opinion. Last January was pretty much when 
the power shifted from Arsene Wenger to Ivan Gazidis to Sven. Raul came in a few months later, but there's no doubt Raul was probably doing a little bit of work for Arsenal in January. Um, and, and last Jan was massive because we saw Alexis Sanchez go and we saw Mkhitaryan come in on around sort of 180 grand or so, which was more than Sanchez was on. Sanchez was on about 130 when he left because he obviously hadn't signed a new contract. So suddenly there was an up, up, upward turn of about 40, 50 on the, on the wage structure straight away. Then obviously we signed the Bamiyang, which, you know, at the time, I mean, even now, what a signing he is. I'm so glad he's here, but he was, he was expensive. He is on big money. So there again, the wages went up. And then obviously we re-signed Mesut Ozil on 300 plus grand a week, which, you know, that, that, that's huge. Obviously him and Arsene Wenger had a great relationship, but it was the club. Ultimately it was the club that sanctioned that deal. Um, so it, it's, it's huge because that was when we probably, uh, you know, that, that would have impacted our, our summer. And, uh, you know, there was rumors about this summer that we only had 50 million to spend. We, we spent about 70 in the end, but they're all pretty modest players, really, weren't they? I mean, Socrates, Lichtenstein, Torreira, absolute star and an absolute dream. But really, he wasn't on that top bracket when we signed him, really. Leno's the same. So, I think January has had a massive impact on, and I think it will on the next couple of transfer windows because of the, the amount we invested. But that was all about, it was a little bit, you know, a bit wishy-washy and a little bit, I think it was a bit of a, the power struggle really that I think if, you know, to get a Bamiyang in was a bit of a kind of, yeah. Uh, Arsene, your time is kind of gone now. It it might have been they might have overpaid slightly for him. They might have given him a little bit more money a week. But Sven obviously knew him. Um, but yeah, all that that January, I don't think we knew it at the time. But that has actually resulted in the whole club kind of it, it's impacted on the whole club for the next few years. And and with the, with the Ramsey thing, obviously you know there was a contract on the table with him. The contract was then removed from from the table. So you know. Be, be, was it a coincidence that Ivan Gazidis went around that same time? Was it, you know, was it kind of a, if Ivan was still here, would the contract still be on the table? Maybe. And let me, let me ask you this. Do you, do you think Emery had any say in that at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I okay. think, I would. I think he would have, they would have asked his opinion on what, what he thinks. Um, I think a question would have been, you know, can Ozil and Ramsey play the same side together? A lot of people will say yes, a lot of people will say no. Um, but if Unai Emery was more around the no, then suddenly you look at, well, Ozil was on 300 grand with, you know, three years left on his deal. So you're probably not going to be able to flog him because nobody's going to want to pay that kind of, you know, amount of wages for him. So yeah, I think, I think Unai Emery would have, but kind of what you're trying to hint here is has, has the, has the kind of people above him made a decision? And I, and I think you're right. I think Raul Sven might have looked at that and think actually we can reinvest that elsewhere. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful that we won't see this sort of situation again. Raul said that straight away. We've been lucky enough to meet him a couple of times in fans forums and he has said straight away about that, you know, that you don't let people go into the last year of their contract. That's when the, the all the power is with the player. Um, so I, I think we'll see players either be sold kind of with two years left or having to sign sort of thing. So I think we will see a change, but I think last January has impacted the club massively. Yeah, I think we definitely need to improve the management of contracts. That's something that's uh, obviously hindering us at this point. You know, we're, we're sitting on yeah. all these assets that we can't move on, but we want to move on. So it's a little problematic but, um, in some ways. Even, even there, I mean, you, you, you asked, you kind of started this little segment about sort of how Arsenal was changed. And even there, Arsenal has changed massively. You know, you had Arsene Wenger, you had Ivan Gazidis, you had Dick Law. Yeah. Kind of doing the contracts. You now have Raul in there. You now have uh, Huss, who kind of is the sort of transfer negotiator. You have a head coach you can input into that. It, it's, you know, what's Josh Kroenke's role in all this as well? He spent a lot of time at Arsenal this year as well. Is he a little bit more involved? My, 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 Probably my guess is yes, he is. So is he an extra opinion in there? Probably not on the footballing side, but certainly on the business side. So I think it's just, yeah, there's a lot more people in there to make sure these kind of things don't happen again. And the way Raul spoke, you, you just, you know, he, 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 you can tell that he has got years of experience. He was obviously at Barcelona in their kind of heyday, kind of when they were great as well. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think there will be the way we handle contracts will be very different. Let's hope so. Uh, let's see. Looking ahead, aims for the season. Um, we are still in the FA Cup, thankfully, uh, and we're also in the Europa League. Uh, won our group. Uh, Ryan, uh, when looking at those two competitions, let's leave top four in Premier League out of it for a second. Looking at those two competitions, how do you think Arsenal and, and Emery are going to treat those? Are, are we going to go all out, try to win them both? Well, I think it, I think it honestly depends on, on the luck of the draw. I mean, we were so unlucky last year with the, with the Europa League. We, some of the teams we had to sp- uh, face, like AC Milan, I, I think not at their best these days, but Atletico Madrid, if you then um, compare that to who Man U faced the year before, mm-hmm. and they had, the, you know, their route to the final. Um, but it just, it just kind of depends. I think you, as he said, I think he's kind of alluded to it yesterday that they asked him like, after Blackpool about, you know, the team selection. And he kind of basically said, well, look, you know, I, I basically said no respect, I know disrespect to, to Blackpool, but, I felt this was a game that I could play the kids in, and if we had maybe a tougher opposition, I'd play the a more senior team. And I think that's what he's going to do for for the rest. Now I think we're playing Bate Borisov, so I think he probably won't take any risks in the first leg of that. But if we get the job done, uh, then he'll he'll go um, he'll play the kids, and I think he'll do the same for the for the FA Cup, and that will. That will be the, I think that will be the procedure for, for the campaign, you know, we'll just keep seeing, I, I think there's no prioritizing one. Having said that, if he, if you were asked me which one he would rather win, it would have, without a quest, a shadow of a doubt, be the Europa League because yeah. that gets into the, the, the Champions League and he's got an unbelievable record in that competition. Yeah. Uh, Anne-Marie, what are your thoughts on those two competitions? Oh, I'm I'm kind of thinking just go for both. Like okay. you said at the beginning, I think Ryan is right. I think the one that he would want to focus on is the Europa League because it's the opportunity to get back into the Champions League. But you know, this weekend we've seen some fantastic results of the FA Cup. It's it's going to be a step up now as, as we head into the fourth round. And the one thing that Arsenal has hang over over it is the fact that it can, the team concedes. So, I think just, you know, go for both competitions. What do you, what do you have to lose at the end of the day? As I said, it, it's a transitional year. He's, he's figuring out who works well together, who doesn't, what he wants to deliver, his philosophy and so on and so forth. I think it's an opportunity to see how players work together as well for both. Um, and, you know, Blackpool was, as you mentioned, right, it was good to, you know, for the kids to come out and play. We've got some fantastic youngsters coming through the ranks. My worry is, you know, with Koscielny, you know, obviously he's come back from injury and then he's back in training yesterday. What does that mean for him going forward? And who can we rely on as a, as a, you know, a centre back for the Europa League games as well as the FA Cup games? Does that mean that Carl Jenkins is going to get more of an opportunity now? I think actually, now I'm thinking out loud, I think, you know, Emery's got some tough decisions to make about who he puts forward for both these competitions. And I think he'll have to decide which is the one that's going to have the greater outcome for the club. I'd like him to do both. That's my personal thought for Arsenal. I'm just wondering if he has that luxury, given that we are injury ravaged. If Arsenal bring in new players, how are they going to bed in if they're still part of the FA Cup as well as Europa League? So many, there's so many variables to it, you know, um, for Arsenal, some tough decisions to be made, I think. I would say, my personal view is I believe that Uno Emery should put out the strongest teams possible for both the competitions. I, I, I actually think he's he's done well with that as well. He is a sort of, he, he rotates really well actually in the competition he, he doesn't see it as I mean that's what that's what sort of Arsene Wenger saw it as the Premier League side and then the Cup side and it was they were quite different and you sort of knew that if you played well in the Cup games you you probably will continue playing in the Cup games but you'll only come into the Premier League team if there's an injury whereas I think with, with Unai Emery it's, it's very different we've seen players like Aubameyang playing the League Cup we've seen Lacazette was on the bench yesterday and came on so I think he's very much a, 
he'll he'll rotate that squad. Um, you may see, you know, someone like an Aubameyang being rested in the Premier League if 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 Unai Emery thinks, you know, there's a team we're playing maybe at home that we you know we, we don't need to play Aubameyang, but I don't know percentage. So that there's a lot of. Uh, the way he does things is quite good. I mean, yesterday, if you look at the back three, he played the strongest back three we had. You know, Koscielny obviously was injured in the warm-up, but Koscielny, Socrates, um, and, uh, uh, well, Koscielny and Socrates are, are two of the main, you know, Mustafi obviously was left out, but that that's that's quite bold. And maybe that's because he hasn't got anyone, you know, he hasn't got a Rob Holding because he's injured, or he hasn't got Mabna Panos because he's still coming back from injury, or Callum Chambers because he's on loan. Maybe he hasn't got much of a choice. But generally, I think he'll, I think he'll go for both. I think the Europa League is what he'll have his eye on, though, as Brian mentions, because of the ticket to the Champions League, because of his experience in it. Because actually, compared to last season, you know, teams like Atletico Madrid and they're not in it. Yeah, we have the English teams, we have Chelsea in there, which 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 will be tough. I think Napoli and Inter were probably the two two big teams to drop out of the Champions League that are, I think are tough. But I think there was a, it was a lot tougher last year. So, yeah, I think I think the Europa League will be huge. I think against Barté, we should be OK, obviously. Um, but going forward, it will be a slight rotation. I don't think he'll get to a stage where, like Mourinho did a couple of years ago, when he basically threw the, threw the Premier League and put all his eggs into the, the, the Europa League basket. I'm not sure. I mean, unless we, we drop quite a lot. I'm not sure Unai Emery will do that as such, but... I, yeah, I don't think he'll be taking any chances in the first leg, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Ryan. I think a lot of it depends on the draws we get um, on some of these games, because, uh, as Henry said, we're, we're kind of thin at the back, so as you're trying to look at player rotation with uh, games coming thick and fast, you're going to have some tough decisions to make. So hopefully we, we get some fortuitous draws and, and can uh, t- t- do a little uh, rotation that doesn't make us so nervous. Of course, any time Mustafi plays, I'm nervous. I don't know how the rest of you feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've said, I've said, I think he's actually, he's improved, but he's always got a, a mistake in him. Um, and and I, I guess it's, it's, it's a quick, it's, you know, I think I brought this up the other day, um, with the other podcast that, and I'll be interested to see what Ryan and Anne-Marie's views are, but for, for, for me at the moment, someone like Mustafi is, is Unai Emery playing him because he hasn't really got a choice or does he actually like him? Because remember, these players aren't Unai Emery's players. He has to get the best out of the players he's got. But I think over the next window or two, you'll see certain players leave. You'll see certain players come in. You know, it, it's fairly obvious that El Nenny isn't going to fit into Unai Emery's plans because we've hardly seen him. But someone like a Mustafi, is he going to fit in or is he not? It, it looks like he is because he's playing week in, week out when he's fit. But is that because there's a lack of choices? I don't know. And why hasn't he played Carl Jenkinson, actually, Akil? I know Carl Jenkinson's come back from a, a long-term injury, but I, I'm fascinated to understand why he hasn't featured him as much because we know that Jenkinson has played in Carabao Cup games. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he just doesn't fancy him. It's just, uh, you know, Carl Jenkinson's obviously, you know, a, a, a decent enough player and stuff like that. He's obviously got Arsenal in his heart, but maybe ultimately, you know, he just doesn't fancy him. But then, you know, you could argue Lichtenstein has been... Oh, one of the most average signings we've probably ever seen. You know, he just looks completely past it. Great off the field and, you know, a leader. And we saw that, uh, you know, in the North London derby in the Premier League when, you know, that Dyer and Ramsey stuff started. Lynch's side was straight in there. He was yeah, loving it. Attitude, yeah, attitude, He was loving it. And, 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 and I totally love that. But as a player on the pitch, he makes me more nervous than Mustafi does. So, yeah, I mean, Amory, you know, to answer your question, Carl Jenkinson versus Lichtenstein is probably quite close. You may even co Carl Jenkinson. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just uh, who he fancies and who he kind of, you know, thinks will do a better job. Yeah, I think uh, d- d- somebody in our, uh, our our fan group here in St. Louis said said over the weekend, well, Lichtenstein was a, a free transfer, but I still want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, bless him and all. I, yeah, I, I hate to love his attitude, though. Players, but yeah, it's just it, it's clear that he's not got it anymore. Yeah. So uh, looking forward, uh, West Ham next weekend is is Nasri going to be in the team? Yeah, he, he is. Probably oh. will. Probably will have a good. Probably have a good game as well. Oh, okay. That that'll be banter worthy, won't it? <laughs> well, uh, 
It's, All right, so let's yeah. circle around. We'll start with Ryan. Uh, looking ahead at West Ham, uh, what do you see there? It's a tough game because I have watched them a couple of times this season, um, and they going forward, they they look very good. They they got this uh, player, Felipe Anderson, uh, playing on the left wing for them, and it, especially our, our right side at the minute, he he looks a proper proper player. He's got dribbling, um, he can shoot, he can go down the line, he can cut in. Um, and I think the style West Ham play at is, is an attractive one and they will get chances in this game. I think it'll, I think it'll be a really good game actually. Um, it'll be quite open. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is a tricky one because, <laughs> not because of this game, but because the following week we're playing Chelsea. Yeah, I want to be in with a chance to overtake Chelsea, or or at least be on level points with them. And they're playing Newcastle at home, which I think will be a three points for them. So I think it is really important that we get the three points here. But I do think it will be a difficult game. So no clean sheet sounds like. <laughs> give us a scoreline. Give us a scoreline. <laughs> there ain't gonna be many clean sheets from from now to the end of this. <laughs> do that. Um. I'm going to say, I think we'll nick it, I think 2-1, 2-1 is a good shout, uh, 2-1 or, or, or 3-1. Okay. So, Anne-Marie, what do you think uh, looking ahead at West Ham and then Chelsea after that? Looking ahead to West Ham, it's a game that Arsenal really need to win because the team need to keep the pressure up on Chelsea to be part of the top four. I'm thinking that Arsenal will win the match, but I think they'll probably concede first. Score-wise, um, I agree, Ryan. I'm going to go for a 2-1. The players to keep an eye on in terms of West Ham is definitely Anatovic and also Anderson. And I think Nasri's going to get a lot of stick from the Arsenal fans when he appears on the pitch. <laughs> I hope so. Akil, are, are you going to be part of that? I am. Oh, absolutely. You know, Sammy, I, I was a lot younger when Sammy and Nasri left Arsenal. You know, I'm sort of, <laughs> I was in my kind of 20s then. I was a little bit more, uh, 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 players used to get to me more. You know, that was the period when obviously Fabregas, Nasri and Van Persie left within a year of each other. And that, you know, as, as a young person, that totally broke my heart. You know, it's, it's not how it is now. I don't kind of, I don't feel that anymore. I don't feel that sense of kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of affection as much now. I've kind of learned to take a step back. But yeah, seeing Sammy and Azri, and then certainly if he has a good game, it will be quite upsetting. Oh, yeah. Um, but what do I think will happen? I think, you know, as, as both have said, really, it, it's, it's huge. Because if you look at our next four Premier League games, we have West Ham, we have Cardiff at the end of the month, but we have Chelsea and we also have Man City away. So, you know, as, as optimistic as we want to be, Man City away is going to be quite a tough game. I think they're going to go on a little bit of a run now after being Liverpool. So you presume that's going to be tough. Um, so really, we we need to beat West Ham. We need to beat Cardiff and, and we hopefully need to beat Chelsea as well. Certainly not lose to Chelsea. So this has to be a win. Um you know, generally, we're probably not going to keep clean sheets. We we can we can score goals. You know, we know that. So, yeah, I think two one is probably logical to Arsenal. Okay, uh, I got to agree with everybody. I don't I don't see us keeping clean sheets. Our our defense has been just a little too porous um, and injury ravaged. Although I I hope that uh, Kishelny can make a comeback. Hope that injury wasn't anything serious. But um, going forward, I'm I'm going to go three one. I'm going to go Arsenal three. Sound good? That's good. So, I mean, Arsenal have, a really, that, yeah. <laughs> Arsenal have a really good head-to-head against West Ham. So I think it's going. I think it's going to be a, a cracking match, a feisty, a feisty encounter for sure. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> I agree. So uh, that will do it. I'd like to thank Ryan Rocastle for joining us. Uh, what is your Twitter handle, Ryan, if people want to find you? Uh, um, it's Ryan Rocastle Seven. All right. Thanks for joining us. No problem at all. And uh, Anne-Marie Batson, where can they find you? I am Anne-Marie Batson on Twitter and Instagram. All right. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. And uh, I'm Rick. You can find me at Golf and Gooner. I don't tweet much. So, so like I said, I'm, I'm an easy follow. <laughs> 
But uh, Akil's a little more active. He's in the social media sphere. So, uh, Akil, give us your final thoughts yeah. and send us send us out. Yeah, so uh, it's Ten Akil on Twitter, as probably most people know. And uh, there's only one way to end, isn't there? Up the Arsenal.